a welcome address from the ITU Secretary General and our Bureau Directors, followed by a high-level panel moderated by the ITU Deputy Secretary General. We conclude with a compilation of videos received from some of our members. So first, our introductory video. We are faced with global, complex challenges. In response, United Nations Member States have adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. Information and communication technologies offer answers for helping achieve the SDGs. Today, we're seeing breakthroughs in crop surveillance, famine and drought prediction. Health and well-being apps can help treat sick people and detect and track epidemics and disease. New and promising technologies in education can help make learning more engaging, interactive and innovative. Opening up new opportunities for all people, regardless of their age or gender. Satellite monitoring and surveillance help us better understand our planet's changing climate and protect all life forms from the very big to the very small. ICTs help promote smarter and cleaner water management, a cleaner power supply, cleaner economic growth and jobs, and smarter infrastructure and cities. The growing use of open data by governments increases transparency, empowers citizens and helps drive economic growth. And more and more of us are in touch via remote methods, including during times of crisis, to get informed and organise our response. But we cannot let ICTs increase existing inequalities or adversely shape attitudes towards women and gender equality, or not deal with the growing issue of e-waste. ITU and its member states will not rest until the digital divide no longer exists. Until we can bring the benefits of technology to everyone, everywhere. And that is the essence of World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. To remember today and the rest of the year, the important opportunities and solutions offered by ICTs. For only in this way can countries achieve the significant change needed to confront the challenges we face today and achieve the SDGs. I now have the great pleasure of introducing a video message from the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, on the occasion of WTISD 2020. Information technology can be a beacon of hope, allowing billions of people around the world to connect. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these connections with loved ones, with schools and colleges, with workplaces, with healthcare professionals and essential supplies are more important than ever. The International Telecommunications Union continues to work with the information and communication technology community and UN agencies to help manage and end this crisis and recover better. New technologies from 5G and big data to cloud computing and artificial intelligence are powerful tools to tackle the world's most pressing challenges, including the pandemic. Leaving no one behind means leaving no one offline. World Telecommunication and Information Society Day reminds us that international cooperation on digital technology is essential to help defeat COVID-19 and achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you. We thank UN Secretary General Guterres for this important video. I now have the pleasure of giving the floor to Mr. Hu Zhao, ITU Secretary General, for an opening address. Yes, ministers and uh, ambassadors, excellencies, my dear UN colleagues, my dear elected officials of ITU, your participants. It is a pleasure to have you all join us online for World Telecommunication and Information Society Day 2020. First, I would like to pay tribute to all ICT works, workers around the world on this special day. The medical workers have sacrificed a lot in this pandemic. We should also recognize the dedication of ICT workers and their contribution during this global war against COVID-19. World Telecommunication and Information Society Day 
is an opportunity every year since 1969 to promote the power of information and communication technology to change and to improve our lives. And today, with the billions of people around the world relying on ICTs to work, to study, and to keep in touch with the loved ones during this crisis, coming together today to reflect on how to bring these technologies to all is more urgent and important than ever before. As the United Nations Secretary General Guterres highlighted in another video a couple of years ago to ITU, and he said, ICTs are a powerful tool which help us to achieve each and every sustainable development goal. That is why today I call on the ITU family and our partners to rally behind our Connect 2030 agenda in support of SDGs. There will be a before and after COVID-19. We must assess the opportunity to speed up the development of a digital society. That means creating a better environment for investment in ICT infrastructure, facilitating the development of new technologies like 5G and using the technologies to help achieve the SDGs. Having a new strategy for information and communication technology at the national level and at the global level has now become more necessary than ever. Together, I'm confident we will come out of this crisis stronger and help build a better digital world where no one is left behind. The world needs SDGs. The SDGs need ICTs. And the ICTs need you. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to invite uh, three directors of ITU management to speak to this audience, starting with uh, BR director Mario Manevich, followed by TSB director Chesap Lee, and concluded by Director of BDT, Doreen Bolton. Mario, please. Good day to all. It is a pleasure to be speaking to you on this date when we celebrate the signing of the first International Telegraph Convention in 1865. Since then, much has changed with regard to communications. In 1906, the first Radio Telegraph Convention gathered 30 states and adopted the first regulations governing wireless telegraphy, which mainly established the principles of communications between vessels and land stations. Last year, the World Radio Communication Conference gathered over 3,400 participants from 163 member states and 130 organizations. The international treaty that is now called the radio regulations governs the use of radio frequency spectrum and satellite orbits, and it applies to 40 radio communication services some of which billions of people use on a daily basis. Comparing the numbers of both conferences gives us a dimension of the changes that happened in the ICT sector during the last century. The regulatory framework established over the years not only ensures that radio communication services can coexist, it also allows for the introduction of new technologies and advanced services from connecting unmanned aircrafts to connecting cars, planes, ships, machines, and all things that can be connected using wireless communications. It also includes new technologies that aim at bridging the digital divide. As you know, although 93% of the population is within the reach of at least a 3G mobile network, 47% of the world's population is still not connected to the internet. New fixed mobile and satellite technologies promise to cover the unconnected, by providing more affordable broadband services. In addition, the development of globally harmonized spectrum and standards entails economies of scale, 
which allows for a wider penetration of services within the lower income population. But having access to radio communications is not an end in itself. The main objective is for technology to be used as an enabler to achieve all other sustainable development goals. Thus, while the first radio telegraph convention ensured safety on the sea, our current radio regulations and standards go further. They aim at ensuring safety on the sea, air, roads, and railways, enabling e-agriculture for a more sustainable food production, promoting financial inclusion, enabling accurate weather prediction and climate monitoring, and enabling e-learning, e-health, and teleworking, which show to be crucial during this COVID juncture. Therefore, after 155 years, evolving from the telegraph towards the radio communication services we, we know today, the contribution of the radio regulations has always been paramount towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues and friends, year 2020 is a key milestone for the ICT industry, and COVID-19 has increased the significance of this milestone. We have seen the need for meaningful connectivity and seen the beginnings of a truly connected life with remote access to business, education, and much more social interaction in virtual space. We see the importance of ICT infrastructure at connecting the many people around the world still not connected to the internet. But we also see the need to improve the quality of ICTs, deliver high quality ICT experiences, safeguard the security and privacy of connected life. The next decade of innovation will build on AI, machine learning on top of ICT infrastructures, such as IMP 2020, 5G systems, future networks, and IoTs in support of smart, sustainable cities. We see that digital transformation of the society is key to the SDGs. So inclusive user needs and market responsible standardization is more important than ever. Working together in standardization is a key avenue for new partners to build mutual trust. So, uh, and we see new partners moving forward together in ITU standardization work for sectors such as energy, transport, healthcare, financial services, agriculture, and smart cities. I welcome you to join the ITU standardization community. ITU standards provide common platforms for growth and innovation. Working together, thinking in a multidisciplinary way, we can ensure that ITU standards help everyone, use everywhere, to share in the ICT advances, transform of our world. So I'd like to conclude by applauding IT members for their preservance uh, through the uh, challenges brought on by COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chai Sub. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, World Telecommunication and Information Society Day is always a very special day for me, as it's also my, my wedding anniversary. Uh, and it's extraordinary to reflect that when I married back in 1996, mobile phone penetration was just over 1%, and the World Wide Web was so new that a mere 25 million or so people were connected. And since then, we've witnessed a huge explosion in connectivity with virtually the whole planet now covered by a mobile signal and more than 4 billion people online. WTISD 2020 comes at a truly extraordinary juncture in human history. And our theme of Connect 2030, which is linked to the UN uh, 2030 agenda, it's taken on an urgency and an amplitude unimaginable just a few months ago. Never before has humankind had to deal with a, a health emergency of this scale and scope and among all the disruption and distress, digital has emerged as the hidden hero of this crisis. And those of us with the connection are the privileged. But we must never lose sight of the fact that even in this age of unprecedented connectivity, every second person on this planet still has to manage without that digital lifeline. And that simply cannot be acceptable. 
And as some nations begin to look past the immediate crisis towards the road to recovery, we need to seize our chance to change this, to build back better, meaning build back better with broadband. Next year, the world's digital community will gather in Addis Ababa for the World Telecommunications Development Conference. And by underscoring the vital importance of digital connectivity, the COVID-19 crisis offers us the unique opportunity to use this conference to harness an unprecedented tide of political will. We may never again benefit from this intense focus that governments are now according to digital networks and services. And next year in Addis, we have this once in a lifetime chance to make huge strides forward in connecting the unconnected. I think the world finally understands that there will be no SDGs without ICTs. So on this WTISD, I urge us to all put universal connectivity at the very top of our post COVID agenda. And let's make this decade of action, the decade where we finally succeed in bringing safe, affordable, accessible access to all. Thank you very much. Thank you to the IT Secretary General and Bureau Directors for these insightful remarks. It is now time to start our high-level panel with our distinguished speakers. I have the pleasure of giving the floor to Mr. Malcolm Johnson, ITU Deputy Secretary General and moderator of today's high-level panel. Mr. Johnson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Nega. And good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We are honored to have five eminent panelists joining us today to discuss ICTs for the Sustainable Development Goals. But unfortunately, I understand Ms. Audrey Azoulay, Director General of UNESCO, will have to leave us shortly for an urgent matter. So with Ms. Balopayev's uh, permission, let me go straight to her first and to save time. I will group her questions. Mrs. Azoulay, what lessons has UNESCO taken from the COVID-19 crisis regarding its work in the digital space and the need to ensure everyone can benefit from it equally? When you consider the billions of students out of school due to COVID-19, for example, and all the measures being taken by governments around the world, how do you see technology supporting continued access to education? And what do you, you think are the main challenges? Mrs. Azule, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, good day. I'm, uh, I'm Audrey Azule, UNESCO Director General, speaking from our headquarters in Paris. And I would like first to say how delighted I am to take part in this panel. And I'd like to thank uh, the ITU and especially its Secretary General for uh, organizing it and, and having me in this panel. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you first because I think that this meeting uh, this day sends a very strong message building on a long history of international cooperation. We are in very uncertain times but as it's been uh, said right, uh, right before me, of, for the first time, a global challenge of this scale, where international cooperation and coordination should be uh, the obvious way forward. But however, we know that there are still clashes between states and political fragmentation. They are still a reality, but our work uh, in institutional and multilateral organization is, is, I think, more important than ever. And it's also a challenge for us. And that's why the United Nations family has taken uh, urgent action, uh, developing a unified strategy to support people around the world. This crisis is taking place at a very special moment for us in our agenda. We are uh, a decade that will bring us to 2030, where we have uh, set for us a very ambitious agenda. And this COVID crisis could have an, uh, an important impact on our efforts. But we have to define in what way. It can be also a wake-up call, drawing attention to crucial areas of intervention. And one of uh, the first lessons that we can uh, learn from this crisis is the importance of connectivity, a cross-cutting topic that is central to all the issues affecting our society. And it's the second reason why I wanted to join you to celebrate World Communication and Information Day. Indeed, in a world under lockdown, the ability to connect to others is absolutely essential. Uh, it's essential in supporting uh, social ties at a time when uh, 
uh, people could gather uh, online despite the physical distancing measures put in place. Essential in supporting culture at a time when uh, the museums, the bookstores, the concert halls were closed, were forced to close, and uh, they've all, all these uh, creative or um, heritage institution wanted to create new forms of links and connection with the, with the public. Essential also for uh, us to stay informed, which is necessary if we want to understand uh, this unprecedented situation. And of course, behind the issue of information, there is the question of misinformation and the need for media and information literary, literacy. Sorry. And lastly, and this is the focus of my remarks today, uh, as you invited me to, it is essential in enabling uh, uh, more than 1.5 billion students to continue learning. Because at the peak of the lockdown, more than 90% of children and young people have, have been affected by school and university closures in more than, a, uh, in, I think, in 195 countries at the same time, at the peak, uh, at the peak level of the, of the lockdowns. And so to address this situation, distance learning tools were deployed at record speeds thanks to the inventiveness and devotion of teachers, but also the mobilization of many, including uh, the telecom uh, uh, partners. Uh, these tools, which uh, already existed, had only been used at very small scales, and they saw their user numbers grow expansionally. Uh, there were, there's been a range of discussion channels, including uh, basic email, but also virtual classrooms, video conferences, so that teachers could find ways to maintain ties with students while adapting uh, the content, the educational content to this unique situation uh, with different methods. And this uh, period and its unprecedented scope of the situation has many lessons to teach us also for the future of education. And it happens right at the moment when we are at UNESCO uh, with our mandate, uh, universal mandate on education trying to anticipate what the futures of education can be. We set up an international commission, the Commission on the Future Education, to, to work on uh, uh, the lessons, uh, not only of COVID-19, but of the situation today for the education of the 21st century. It's a commission which is uh, chaired by the president of, the, of Ethiopia, Ms. Saleh Wogzude, and composed of renowned experts and academics. And it's been charged with developing this forward-looking vision of what education should look like in 2050. And it's a report we're going to publish next year. And with, uh, in order to publish this report, to prepare it, we've also uh, used for the first time a, a very large participation-oriented methods with all players, including, of course, the education community, young people, civil society around the world. But there is one thing already that we know. It is that digital solution will be crucial in the equation, and at the same time that all digital solutions cannot be today viable. Not even the most advanced forms of connectivity can replace what we saw that was missing during this crisis, the human interactions, uh, the teaching methods that, that rely on human interactions and that are central to the learning process. And we're also at a time when half of the global population doesn't have an internet access, so we know that if we were today to implement all digital solutions, it would exacerbate the very inequalities that the, that the Agenda 2030 seeks to fight. And these equal inequalities in terms of uh, access affect all society. When we looked at the number of uh, student children that were out of school because of the crisis, we found that uh, more than 40% of them didn't have internet access at home and this number would rise to 82% in Sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, insufficient access to internet is not the only problem. There's also the issue of the digital skills. According to the report that, we, uh, that uh, has been published by the Broadband Commission, which is co-chaired by uh, uh, President Kagame, Carlos Slim, the ITU, and UNESCO, the lack of digital skills is the biggest barrier today to internet use less than 30% of people around the world have the, necessity, the necessary digital skills, and this figure drops down to 10% uh, in the most underprivileged regions. There is also another aspect of those uh, inequalities that, con that, are, that is still very present in the digital world, which are the gender inequalities. 
And I, I'd like to, to mention a report uh, that we've published last year, uh, which is called I'd Blush If I Could, which relates uh, the inequalities in education to the inequalities in jobs uh, in the digital sphere. And we saw, according to this study, that women are four times less likely than men to master digital skills. So in front of all these inequalities, uh, what have we done during uh, the crisis in terms of education and remote learning? Well, we launched uh, a global education coalition in March to address the crisis, a coalition that has uh, currently 90 partners, which is very operational still today. And I would like to thank as well ITU for being one of our partners. We've established agreements with major telecommunication players uh, that I'd like to thank here. Uh, again, Orange, Vodafone, Telefonica, that uh, found a low-cost connectivity solution so that we could um, ensure the continuity of learning in many countries, especially in Africa, which is uh, our priority. We've also developed uh, complementary forms of remote learning that are not only digital, but that also use uh, radio or TV. And this consideration on digital development should also guide us in other fields, including uh, culture. We need to think about the impact of the changing cultural economic models that are more and more digital in the cultural fields. And this is uh, one of the goals of a series of debates that we launched online, of course, uh, the Resili Art uh, Movement that brings together artists, cultural institutions, professionals and governments so that uh, we see how we can use um, connectivity so that cultural diversity is not weakened uh, during the, the crisis. And uh, I think the crisis has also shown us something very important for the digital uh, sphere, which is that we need to have more anticipation and reflection on uh, the ethics side, the ethical side of uh, the use of big data and AI, and including health data. It's a very important issue um, all around the world. And this, is, has, to, this also has, has to lead us to, to the creation of normative instruments and hopefully at a global level, in the use of big data. So I wanted just to mention those few issues that are very important because I think most of the lessons that we learn from the crisis, and we will learn more in the future, shows that connectivity is central to how we deal with it. So I wanted to be with you for this, uh, for this day, and I want to thank you again uh, for this panel and for the organization of this event. Thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Azoulay. And uh, thank you for emphasizing the importance of connectivity, especially uh, for providing 1.5 billion students uh, to carry on with their studies online and the need to bring this uh, connectivity to all. Thank you again and sorry you have to leave us. Now, uh, returning to our published program, let me welcome Mrs. Tatiana Valovea, Director General, United Nations Office in Geneva. And again, I'll group the questions to each panelist to save time. Please note uh, that participants can pose questions to the panel using the chat function. Please send any questions you may have to my colleague, Jose Maria. So, uh, Mrs. Valovea, the United Nations is working hard around the clock everywhere to ensure that the COVID-19 pandemic does not derail the gains made towards the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. How are ICTs and the digital transformation contributing to address this? What are the challenges and the opportunities you see for the UN in a world that may continue to be in virtual mode for some time, the new normal? And lastly, how do you see ITU's Connect 2030 agenda as a contribution to achieving the global goals and leaving no one behind. This is Balobea. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations on this very important day. And I think it's the first time we are celebrating it in a proper way, using all the modern information technologies. Of course, I would say that digital uh, transformation, of which we have been speaking for the last several years, is no longer transformation. We are already in a digital era. And without the information and communication technologies, we wouldn't be able to work 
these days we wouldn't be able to continue our business, we wouldn't be able to carry out our mandates. I would like to say that United Nations, uh, we have been well prepared for this new mode of work because of our obvious origin. We've been uh, in permanent contact with our headquarters, with our duty stations, and we've been using these technologies for many, many years. But over the last two months, we practically are working online. And because of these technologies, we've been able to uh, continue our important mandates. We've been able to continue our work. I would like to give you just a couple of examples. Apart from uh, working online on our internal issues, we've managed to carry out quite a number of very important events here in Geneva and all online. First of all, and Secretary General of ITU, Poland, participated in this event on the 24th of April. We had a very important discussion, very important dialogue on the future of the United Nations, global conversation around the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, with the participation of a huge audience. And that really showed us that this new way of conferencing, this new way of doing business, are always challenging, but at the same time, they're providing huge opportunities because the audience uh, which we can cover is much bigger than we normally can reach. And uh, their success of this first event led us to the necessity to have another event later in June. Another thing, we, over these months, we've been able to organize some sessions of the Human Rights Council of other uh, bodies exactly using these technologies. So I would like to say that that was very important. Apart from the fact, which was already mentioned by many people, that because of digital uh, uh, communication, we can uh, have uh, ties with our families, our loved ones, with our friends. We can go on with our cultural activities, go to theaters, go to the exhibitions. And by the way, I would like to invite all of you to another uh, online event we are staging uh, in the uh, United Nations office in Geneva, exactly art exhibition, which was launched on the 15th of May. I invite everybody to go there. We have fantastic art uh, offered by uh, uh, permanent missions here in the Geneva, art or the established artists. And the topic of this exhibition is the future we want. It's another part of our global conversation of the 75th anniversary. And the exhibition is there online and you can visit and vote and participate in the discussion around this very important thing. But at the same time, we saw quite a lot of challenges because still we have certain problems with going online with conferences, including interpretation, making decisions how to vote, making decisions how to verify uh, uh, the personality. There are lots of challenges we have to address still. And of course, we understand that, well, online conferencing, online business is not an alternative to human uh, uh, touch. It's not alternative to our physical meeting, our physical discussions, and international relations can't survive without our personal meetings, without building trust, without building communication. What are the lessons and the futures for this current pandemic and digital and uh, the sustainable development goals? Of course, we understand now that really lots of sustainable development goals can be reached better and quicker using modern ICTs. Health, it was already said, health, telemedicine is a very important thing which will allow us to uh, minimize the divide between the countries, between the poorer and the richer in this very important thing. Education, we've seen the success of online education and of course it's a trend which was going to be there. Climate change, sometimes we forget uh, how uh, much uh, we are producing a uh, uh, negative effect on the climate. Before we were only thinking in theoretical terms. Now, after practically three months of lockdown, we can see the huge changes in climate and environment. 
People in Indian cities can see the mountains, the Himalaya. People in Venice can see crystal water in Venice channels. People in big megapolis can breathe fresh air. And that's the result of us not carrying out our uh, normal economic activities. So that's important to see how we can change our activities in a more sustainable way. We can less travel and use these uh, modern uh, things of communication. We can really use modern technologies. So what uh, is important for us uh, for the Sustainable Development Goals agenda, speaking about digital and pandemic? We think that the issue of digital divide, which was already raised, is crucial. If we really increase this divide, that will mean that lots of people will be left behind. So for us, it's important to use digital technology, information technologies to minimize this divide, not to increase it. And I think that's a very important issue on the agenda. Another issue with digital, I really think we can build more multilateralism. Now there are lots of issues about the future of multilateralism. I personally believe that the result of this pandemic will be more multilateral cooperation. Because we see that all the challenges, be it health challenge or climate challenge, they are global challenges. That's why we need global solutions, multilateral solutions. So we really can use these digital technologies in order to have more multilateralism. Because multilateralism means not only intergovernmental cooperation, it means more cooperation between the governments, civil society, region, international organizations, experts, uh, communities, youth movement, etc. And of course, information technologies can help us to do it. So I'm absolutely sure that the next day, and I hope so, we will uh, celebrate in a physical presence, but using modern information and communication technologies. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Golovea. Very interesting uh, presentation and interesting to see that um, some of these virtual platforms can actually increase uh, the participation and inclusiveness. And uh, of course, the, uh, the clear need to address the digital divide and the importance of uh, multilateralism to address uh, crises like the one we're facing now. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Francis Guri, Director General of WIPO. Mr. Guri, as the agency within the UN system responsible for intellectual property services, policy, information and cooperation, what are the challenges you have had to address to ensure business continuity in providing these services at this time? And which digital technologies are assisting you most in this regard? How do you see ICTs and intellectual property driven innovation taking a central role to solve our shared global challenges? Mr. Guri. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Very nice to see you. Uh, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be on this panel with uh, Director General Tatiana Varabaya. Greetings. Uh, and uh, Hulin Jao, uh, Secretary General. Um, Greetings also and congratulations to uh, Hulin and to all of the staff at uh, ITU. I think this is a very significant occasion because, um, of course, the uh, COVID crisis and pandemic has emphasised the importance of connectivity, as has been said uh, already, and um, our virtual existence, actually. Uh, and I think ITU, it's a great testimony, testimony, testimony to the enduring sustainability of international technical cooperation. Because of course you were founded, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 1865, uh, and you've had such a long period of successful international cooperation. The basis of it is technical. Now for us at the World Intellectual Property uh, Organization, well, uh, for your first question, um, the transition uh, as a consequence of confinement and the measures that we've seen put in place to preserve our society from the virus um, has been rather seamless because 
most of our services are delivered on digital platforms. Uh, so we connect with users who are filing international patent applications, international trademark applications, international design applications, and so forth um, on digital platforms. Uh, so this has been a rather seamless, it's been, uh, of course, um, a great affirmation of, of the viability of remote working, actually, uh, that we've seen. Uh, and then many of our information products, of course, are similarly delivered through databases and online platforms. Uh, and so these have uh, continued in this, this mode. So we've reached 100% capacity in our service delivery. However, uh, there are uh, areas where a physical presence or existence is necessary. And the two areas I think where, where we are focusing, where we have not you know, fully um, achieved the success, a successful transition, and, and we may be not be able to, are first of all meetings. Well, of course, this is a great example of how we can all come together uh, through virtual platforms. But human interaction is important. Uh, and I would stress this point in particular. Uh, multilateralism is about inclusivity. Uh, and when we have so many parts of the world without adequate connectivity, then the viability of virtual meetings is questioned. Uh, so I think uh, this underlines uh, well a lot, of, a lot of the important work that is being done by ITU, of course. But for all of us, how do we ensure full inclusivity in virtual meetings as we go in this in negotiating or navigating this uh, crisis? The other area is, of course, capacity building. Now, um, as Audrey Azule has uh, emphasized, of course, there's a lot that can be done on digital platforms. Uh, we ourselves have distance learning programs that, uh, that are very successful and, and include a wide participation worldwide. But uh, some physical contact is necessary. And so I think capacity building really is an area that uh, we are focused on as well in uh, coming back to the full service provision of the organization. Now, moving to your second question, uh, and that is um, digital technologies and uh, IP uh, intellectual property innovation uh, playing a more central role in solving our shared global challenges. And I think that is the case. Well, uh, you know, it's not an original thought. Many people have made these observations, but I think one of the uh, things that we are witnessing with this uh, pandemic and this crisis and the social and economic response to it uh, is the acceleration of certain uh, pre-existing trends. Uh, trends that were already there, but they've been accelerated as a consequence of, of the pandemic. One of those, of course, uh, pre-existing trends was the trend towards much greater connectivity. This is not just rising because of uh, the pandemic. It's already been there. Uh, fortunately, because it has enabled us to negotiate the pandemic in a much better manner than we would have been had we been living in an entirely physical world. So I see that uh, I, uh, ICTs um, are crucial to the new world that we will be constructing as we come back and restart the economy and restart society. Uh, I think also that innovation is going to be central to this process because what's innovation? Well, really, it's about doing things in new ways. Well, we are going to have to do that. If we do things in exactly the same way, we're not going to be able to develop an adequate response to the many challenges that are being thrown up to the economy and to society by this uh, pandemic. So innovation is going to be important and uh, fundamental. Now, innovation is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, a word that's around, thrown around uh, quite a lot uh, uh, and everyone talks about innovation. It's actually a com very complex phenomenon in society and in the economy, a very complex uh, phenomenon. We use in our global innovation in over 80 indicators or components to measure innovation capacity and performance. It's not something that depends on one little secret. Of course, 
intellectual property is an essential part. Uh, it's not a sufficient part by any means, but it's essential for providing an economic in incentive. It's an essential also to enable uh, startups, the many startups on whom we rely for innovation, to negotiate this extremely perilous journey from idea to commercial product or service. And there are so many obstacles in that way, and they need a protective passage uh, through this very difficult um, journey. Now, um, I think here uh, we are going to see more innovation. We are going to need more innovation uh, to develop our new society. And I think one of the issues that we're going to see uh, central to all of this, it's actually an old issue for intellectual property, and that's the question of balance and access. So uh, I regard intellectual property really as a discipline that seeks to achieve a balance between competing interests of many, many stakeholders. So there, there are interests, to put it shortly, of producers, but there are interests of co consumers. And you have to find a balance. Now, what everyone is interested in right now is will there be adequate access to new medical technologies, to treatments, to cures, to vaccines? Uh, and it arises in the cultural sphere too. Is there adequate access to uh, content, educational content? Uh, so this is one big driver, of course. The other driver is that we, you know, access doesn't arise as a question unless you have something to have access to. So we do need to stimulate the innovation and we need the economic incentives in place to stimulate the innovation. So this question of balance, it's all around and it's accentuated like so many things by the pandemic. Uh, and it's a challenge for all of us policymakers and member states to come up with appropriate answers that respect the urgency and the primacy of health considerations, but also the fact that we are going to have to construct a viable economy to bring us all back to uh, the new normality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Um, thank you for those uh, insightful comments. Um, well, you mentioned uh, connectivity again as being uh, the most important uh, factor in continuing our work. Uh, it's proved to be satisfactory for the remote working uh, you mentioned, but of course when it comes to meetings we have to ensure that all parties have uh, equally good uh, connectivity. And it's interesting that uh, you see uh, the challenges that we're facing now with COVID-19 might actually be um, a spur for for innovation. Uh, let's uh, certainly hope so. So um, now I'd like to welcome Mr. Pateri Talas, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Mr. Talas, despite uh, COVID-19, climate change remains arguably the most severe challenge facing our planet. What parallel threat do you see and how are ICTs and science contributing to identify, assess and mitigate the effects of climate change. Can you share some examples of how ICTs are contributing to assess the impact on our climate now and maybe in relation to global lockdowns and travel restrictions? Mr. Talas. Thank you, Malcolm, and, and, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, from WMO's side, we are really grateful for the fact that ITU exists. Uh, we established uh, just after you. you, you may be the oldest uh, UN agency and we are the second oldest one. Once you uh, invented Telex, we were able to start uh, accessing weather data, which, was, which is the basis of, uh, of weather forecasting. So we are grateful for you and uh, we always regard you as our big brother. And, uh, and today we have also excellent cooperation. Without your efforts, uh, we wouldn't be able to run our uh, global observing system consisting of satellites, uh, ground-based observations, uh, and uh, aircraft op observations and so forth. So, so you are still very important for us. And, and we are grateful for you that you are protecting 
certain radio frequencies, which are, for example, important for for our satellite measurements. And, and I know that there's a, there's a battle going on in that field, and uh, and we are grateful for you and uh, also especially my colleague Hulin for for great uh, great support in that uh, respect. As you said, uh, we are we, we are in the middle of uh, uh, COVID crisis at the moment, but. Uh, we are also, uh, we are also. I, I don't call it the climate crisis, but uh, we have major challenges when it comes to climate uh, change. It's already very visible. And uh, two weeks ago, we just published our most recent uh, climate report, uh, what uh, to, to describe what has what has been happening during the past uh, five years. And um, and uh, so far, we have seen 1.1 degree warming, and the last five years uh, were the warmest uh, five years in 1850 when, when we started global observations. In, at the high northern latitudes uh, in the Arctic, we have seen two to three, three degrees uh, warming so far. And it's very likely that during the coming 10 years, uh, we would reach the lower limit of uh, Paris Agreement, 1.5 at least on a temporary basis. We have been storing most of our extra heat to the oceans, uh, which have been uh, warming uh, half degree so far. And it's more than 90% of the extra heat uh, is, is stored uh, there. And that's contributing to sea level rise, but it's also, also a source of energy for tropical storms. And we have started seeing growing amount of uh, category four and five uh, tropical storms and, uh, and related uh, damage uh, to in, in various parts of the world, both in Pacific, uh, Caribbean, uh, and, and also, also in Indian Ocean, which is a new feature for us. Actually, there's one tropical storm that's just uh, going to hit uh, Bangladesh and, uh, and, uh, and, and India in the coming, coming days, and, uh, and, and those areas are very, very, very vulnerable. Recently, we have seen uh, uh, extreme flooding in eastern Africa. We have broken uh, all, all time highs in, uh, in rainfall amounts during the past two months, and uh, besides that, they are having a severe locust uh, crisis and, uh, and this COVID case does not make their life uh, easier either. So we are very much talking about this kind of multi, multi hazards. And uh, because of higher temperatures, we have started seeing growing amount of uh, uh, population which are exposed to heat waves. And uh, about 20 years ago, we, we used to have uh, around 20 million people uh, on an annual basis which were suffering from heat waves. and. Uh, in the past couple of years, we have seen more than 200 million people suffering from, from heat waves. And these heat waves have also been contributing uh, to forest fires in the home of Francis, for example. Uh, we were having record uh, high temperatures and uh, record low amount of uh, rainfall, and, uh, and, and that led to uh, very devastating uh, forest fires in the eastern part of uh, Australia. And this has been also happening in Canada, in Russia, in Sweden, as, as examples during the re recent, uh, recent years. The sea level rise has been accelerating. Uh, during the last century, we typically had uh, one to two millimeters per year sea level rise. And uh, during the past uh, 10 years, uh, uh, the numbers have been four to five millimeters per year. And, uh, and, and we have, for example, tripled the melting of uh, uh, Greenland uh, glacier. And, uh, and also the Antarctic glacier has begun melting. And, and th those are the big glaciers which will finally have a big impact on, on sea level rise. And, uh, and uh, when we look at the glaciers, we have seen a boost in the melting of the glaciers. And that's bad news when it comes to uh, availability of uh, water in the big rivers uh, worldwide. Here in Europe, it's River Rhine, for example. But in India and China, there are big rivers which have their origin from Himalayan uh, glacier, and, and, and this is not, uh, not so good, good news. In the Arctic, we have already melted 75% of the sea ice uh, mass. And perhaps the biggest impacts of, uh, of, uh, of climate change they have been felt uh, through changes in, in precipitation uh, patterns. And, uh, and, and we have, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's more evap evaporation from the oceans because of the high, uh, higher temperatures of the seawater, which is contributing to flooding problems in some parts of the world. 
But on the other hand, in some parts of the world, we have seen a decrease in, in rainfall amounts and, uh, and that has been contributing to the hunger problem. According to our colleagues at FAO, uh, we have seen 33 million people more during the past couple of years uh, suffering from hunger as compared to the situation five years ago. So this uh, climate change is also felt uh, uh, through such, uh, such means. And, uh, and, and those who are interested in finances, uh, uh, the costs related to natural disasters uh, related to weather, uh, they have tripled since the, since the 80s. So these uh, events are becoming more and more expensive. And, uh, and uh, what, 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 what's the message from uh, climate mitigation community is that uh, it's much cheaper to mitigate and to live with the consequences of climate change. And uh, with this COVID, we are having now a short-term uh, uh, economic crisis and short-term health crisis, but if we fail with uh, uh, climate mitigation, then we would have a persistent uh, crisis, uh, both in economy and, and also in human, human well-being. And it's, it would be totally different magnitude from, from the crisis where we are in at the, at the moment. And, uh, and, and the good news is that we have all the means to, to solve this problem. And, uh, and, and this passion that we are having worldwide uh, devoted to COVID uh, solution, uh, if we could uh, transfer a fraction of that, uh, we could solve the, the, the climate problem. And, and this climate problem uh, is, uh, is much easier to solve. So we don't need uh, major changes in our lifestyles and, uh, and, and, and also money-wise, uh, the costs would be uh, rather, rather moderate. And, and then your second question was related to the uh, uh, experiences uh, uh, of, uh, of, of this COVID crisis. And uh, at WMO, we have started uh, teleworking. Uh, we have only 20 people who are coming to the building on, on a daily basis. And, uh, and, and uh, it has been a great surprise to me how well we have been able to carry, carry out our duties uh, despite of this teleworking culture. And, uh, and, and this is... Uh, we have learned that, uh, that in the future we could uh, easily uh, promote such a culture and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and also in, in return we, would, we could uh, think of our office space use in the future so they, we could have much more this kind of common office space and, uh, and, and, uh, and also read some savings, uh, savings there. And of course we have to make sure that, uh, that you from ITU you are providing us uh, good means for those, uh, but at least in the Geneva region, things seems to be functioning fairly, fairly well. And, and we have all learned how to, how to use new means of, uh, of IT and, uh, and, and those have been great. The other, other lesson that we have learned is related to our video conferences. Uh, we have organized lots of uh, video conferences, up to 100 people participating, and uh, that has been also a very positive, uh, positive experience. Uh, and, uh, and, and that has saved us lots of uh, traveling time, working hours, money, and, uh, and we don't have too many people who are having jet lag when they're coming to our meetings. So this, is, uh, this has allowed us to have much more, much more frequent meetings, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's what we are going to promote also in the, in the future. There's a need to have face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, every now and then, but uh, to know, learn to know the people, but... Uh, but I think that the world won't be different, uh, won't be the same after this, uh, this crisis is, uh, is, uh, is over. So this is, uh, this is very good and, and we have to improve our video confer confer conferencing means uh, and, uh, and these uh, this, uh, uh, internet connections uh, that you are very much in, in charge of, uh, they should be and could be imp improved and especially uh, we have some challenges with developing country participation and, uh, and, and this kind of equality has to be ensured. Finally, I would like to say that uh, we have been able to reduce at least 6% of our carbon dioxide emissions this year because of, uh, of, uh, of changes in uh, transportation industry and uh, energy use patterns and, uh, and uh, there has been a major improvement in air quality in China, India, here nearby, Italy, in Paris and uh, and, and that's also good news, and uh, and, and we could uh, carry over some of these uh, these good good practices by by uh, uh, traveling less in the future and uh, 
uh, by commuting less uh, to our offices in the future. So that's uh, that kind of things uh, we, we have been uh, thinking of at WMO side. So thanks for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, and, uh, and and we are grateful for for the excellent cooperation with ITU and, and several colleagues uh, around the screens. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pateri. Thank you for putting uh, COVID-19 into perspective. And uh, of course, in ITU, we're very pleased to work with WMO to protect uh, the spectrum that you need for the meteorological uh, observations, especially, of course, for satellites around the 24 gigahertz area. Um, and interesting to see that um, there may be some benefits coming from the new normal uh, in terms of uh, sustainability and and the uh, the fight against climate change. So thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to invite His Excellency Mr. Vakif Sedikov, Ambassador of the Republic of Abidjan. Ambassador, as the chair of the Geneva chapter of the Non-Aligned Movement, how are these countries working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? Are ICTs contributing to accelerate all 17 goals or are there specific areas where ICTs are contributing more, do you think? And related to the COVID-19 pandemic, how is the Non-Aligned Movement organized to respond in the different areas of education, healthcare, essential goods and services, as well as working from home? And are there any special examples you'd like to give from Abidjan? Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. And first of all, I would like to greet all distinguished speakers and express my gratitude to the <coughs> Secretary General of ITU for giving me the honor to speak, to speak at this uh, event and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. So today I would like to uh, speak on behalf of the Non-Aligned Movement, which is, as you uh, know, is the second biggest political union after the United Nations in terms of the, its composition having 120 member states. Now, the implementation of Agenda 2030 with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals remains at the center of national uh, agendas of all the non-member states, of course, with a varying uh, degree of success. At the 18th uh, NAM Summit, which was held in Baku last um, October, the non-member states expressed their full support to the role of the ITU in assisting member states to build their ICT capacities. We appreciate the role of the ITU in supporting the NAM countries in making ICTs affordable to all through developing programs to build the necessary physical infrastructure, strengthen cybersecurity, improve digital inclusion for people with special needs, and promote ICT-centered innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. And the non-aligned movement believes that the ITU Connect 2030 agenda will play an important role in bringing the digital divide and using the ICTs in advancing Agenda 2030 in the non-member states. The initial step in this direction uh, for us, for the chairmanship of the NAM during these three years, uh, would be the first uh, non-aligned movements conference of ministers responsible for ICT and innovations that the Azerbaijani chairmanship is, all, uh, is going to organize under the overall uh, theme of development of ICT infrastructure in the context of SDG implementation. And we're, scheduled to, um, we're scheduling it to take place by the end of this year if the situation will uh, develop uh, positively. And we hope that the ITU as a knowledge partner will support the Azerbaijani chairmanship in organizing this uh, important event. Enhancing support to developing countries, of course, is fundamental, including through the provision of uh, development financial resources, transfer of technologies on favorable terms, enhanced international support, and targeted capacity building. At the multilateral, uh, in the multilateral level, the NAM member states and international organizations should continue to foster greater uh, collaboration. And that is why the participation uh, today of the distinguished heads of the international organizations who spoke before me, uh, they, it reaffirms opportunities for coordination and interaction 
even in today's extraordinary circumstances. Uh, the non-aligned movement also uh, stresses the importance of strengthening the South-South cooperation, which is complementary to North-South cooperation as another important avenue for accelerating the implementation of SDGs. The non-aligned movement believes that ICTs can help accelerate progress towards all 17 SDGs as the power of ICTs in the contemporary world is undeniable. The ICTs have a great potential to deliver quality goods and services in such areas like healthcare, education, finance, commerce, governance, agriculture, among others. To fully benefit from these opportunities, it is imperative to address digital divide in access to ICT tools and broadband connectivity between developed and developing countries. Uh, the Nomaland movement also reaffirms the importance of the inclusion of youth in the process of implementation of SDGs and national development policies. At the sidelines of the NAM summit, which was held in Baku last October, the Azerbaijani chairmanship organized the first ever Non-Aligned Movements Youth Summit, which established the NAM uh, Youth Network to enable youth representatives uh, from the member states to exchange views, visions and perspectives on current challenges they face in ensuring the sustainable progress. As for the ICT's contribution to accelerate the implementation of SDGs, first of all, we have to consider the impact of a digital divide at a global level. Digital divide uh, needs to be transformed into digital opportunities as about almost half of the world's population are not using the internet as we're speaking. In the new normal that is unfolding as a result of COVID-19, the international community should work together to free up resources to SDG investments and build national capacities to pursue both pandemic recovery and uh, SDG achievement. Uh, the power of ICTs has also been vital in terms of uh, disasters. Uh, disaster risk reduction now clearly includes uh, pandemics and with all these um, new technologies through the early warning systems, it could uh, also encompass the health-related operations. While technology transfer is important, there are nevertheless barriers to the volume and quality of transfers that developed countries can on their own accord or through fair bilateral and regional agreements carry out. It is also important to emphasize the need to enhance efforts for a conducive environment, including favorable policies and regulations. The intellectual property systems have built in flexibilities that may be relevant when addressing the current pandemic and ensuring that the achievement of the SDGs is not uh, derailed. In general, we believe that the response must be holistic, yet tailored to specific uh, needs. Uh, now, uh, as regards the second question of yours, uh, I would like to say that the uh, ongoing pandemic has unprecedented impact on the globe and the non-member states are not an exception. The enactment uh, and application of unilateral coercive economic measures ag against some member states of the movement have an impact on the capacity of these states to respond efficiently, specifically in the acquisition of medical equipment and supplies, and to adequately treat the population of entire countries in the face of this pandemic. This year, the Non-Aligned Movement uh, celebrates the 65th anniversary of the Bandung Principles, which established the foundation of the movement. And the uh, non-member states strongly believe that it is only through solidarity and cooperation among the states that the coronavirus can be contained and defeated. The preservation and strengthening of the values of multilateralism and all forms of international cooperation is a key at this crucial moment. Proceeding from the importance to make an effective contribution to these global efforts, the Azerbaijani uh, NAM chairmanship has established the NAM contact group in response to COVID-19. And the first virtual summit of this contact group at the level of heads of state and government took place on the 4th of May by the initiative and under the chairmanship of the president of Azerbaijan, who is at the same time the current chair of the non-aligned movement. The summit discussed ways for intensified international cooperation and solidarity to contain the 
pandemic. And the heads of state and government uh, reiterated the support to the values of multilateralism with the United Nations at its core and expressed its support, their full support to the WHO and its leadership. Azerbaijan, in its capacity of the chair of the movement, uh, has also announced a financial contribution in the amount of 5 million US dollars to WHO to support the most affected member states of the non aligned movement. We also established at this summit uh, the Non-Aligned Movements Task Force, which is mandated to elaborate database containing information on basic humanitarian and medical needs of the member states so that it can be further submitted to donor countries, international organizations, and other stakeholders for possible support and assistance. Uh, in tackling the global pandemic, the ICTs have been always at the heart of national response strategies in tackling the, the pandemic. And uh, the non-member states uh, also have accumulated sound experience to a wider use of ICTs in these circumstances. And it is the intention of Azerbaijani chairmanship to collect these best practices uh, and to subsequently share them with the wider international community. Now, speaking in my uh, national capacity, I would like to say a couple of words about Azerbaijan. And I would like to say that we have been actively using ICTs in our national response to cope with the uh, pandemic from the early stages uh, of it. Uh, one stop digital platform making e services available to everyone during the pandemic was launched allowing the visitors to find links to online uh, stores, e-education, e-health, e-entertainment, e-food, and so on and so forth. The platform also provides um, advice on social distancing and staying at home and other numerous e-learning resources. Another uh, e special e-platform has been established in Azerbaijan to enable people to get permissions to leave their homes during the uh, quarantine regime and for employers to get permissions for their staff to go to their offices. We also established the brand new video conferencing system based on a locally designed and produced cloud infrastructure. And we already tested it during the uh, virtual summit of the Cooperation Council of Turkic speaking states on April 10th. And during the NAM uh, summit on COVID uh, on May uh, 4th. And also the comprehensive distant educational system has been launched in Azerbaijan, assisting children, students to learn from home. TV lessons are now broadcasted on national TV channels with recorded TV programs made available online uh, by the Ministry of Education. Most of the universities are using Microsoft Teams platform or some other platforms provided uh, free of charge by the Ministry of Education for online uh, teaching processes. I don't want to abuse too much uh, precious time of the audience. Uh, I would uh, probably stop here and uh, would like again to thank the ITU for this possibility to speak on behalf of the non-aligned movement and also would like to, uh, to thank all the uh, distinguished speakers who already presented the views before me. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And um, speaking on behalf of the, uh, the non-aligned movement of 120 uh, member states, um, thank you for the support to ITU and, and uh, inviting ITU to participate in your event, which hopefully will take place in Baku uh, at the end of this year. As you mentioned, uh, multilateralism is, is now more important than, than ever before. And uh, I think uh, from the presentations we've seen from all the panelists, I think uh, it's clear that uh, that is a fact. So um, let's uh, turn then to see if we have uh, any uh, more questions um, from the participants. Uh, I, I noticed that um, we do seem to be running a bit over time. So uh, what I'd like to do is to um, take uh, what the general theme that uh, I can see from uh, many of these questions and consolidate them and put to 
each of our panelists, and that is, how do you envisage the long-term impact of COVID-19 on the achievement of the sustainable development agenda? So um, if we could uh, turn first to uh, Mrs. Belovia, please. Thank you very much. I think that's the most important question we have now how the current situation is going to influence our achievement of uh, SDGs. We all realize that pandemic has led to tremendous social and economic consequences. Many economies are already in recession and we can foresee very huge economic consequences for many uh, sectors of economy, for many uh, millions of jobs, for many enterprises, especially small and medium enterprises in uh, many sectors of economy, tourism, uh, aviation, transportation, service, etc. So apparently in order to overcome the consequences, we'll need huge uh, stimulating packages, financial, social, and economic. And of course, the governments have to invest lots of uh, public money into these projects. On the other hand, sustainable development goals also need financing. And for the years to come, we were uh, estimating the necessity about three trillion uh, dollars per year. So now the question is, can we combine these two goals? Because if we can use the public money, which are now discussed in order to stimulate economy, not just to return to business as usual, but to build back better, to recover in a sustainable way, then the result of this crisis will be positive for sustainable development goals. We understand the necessity, and we really saw during this crisis that those vulnerable, they are really the first to suffer from the crisis. National minorities, children, women, many other uh, uh, poor countries, were the first to suffer from the results of this pandemic. So we really have to invest. And I think that if really we can use this public money to rebuild the economy in a sustainable way, that will make us reaching uh, the sustainable uh, development goals uh, easier. Because really now we have obliged to uh, really uh, invest lots of money international economies. Let's invest them wisely and sustainably. Then the result of this crisis will be not only, uh, only negative results, but a more sustainable one. And as it was already said, during these three months of a lockdown, we saw that if we are behaving in a sustainable way, we can really improve the quality of our life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to see uh, that uh, perspective that uh, this will require a lot of investment uh, to recover economies and uh, we have the potential to ensure that that investment is uh, invested in sustainable uh, uh, areas. So thank you very much, Mrs. Belovia. And um, same question then to Francis. Guri, Francis. Thank you, Malcolm. Well, I spoke earlier about the crisis exacerbating or accelerating certain uh, pre-existing trends. And one of those pre-existing trends that we saw developing over the last decade or decades was growing inequality. So I think there is a, a huge risk here uh, with the pandemic that it will exacerbate that trend of growing inequality and we need to take action in respect of this. Now, Tatiana, Director General of Adavaya has, has given us some good leads on this. Um, uh, on this very point. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going to apply in terms of health treatment uh, that we're seeing. A lot of tension is focused on that, but it's going to apply in respect to the economy because whether we like it or not, the uh, pandemic has disrupted. Well, it's stopped our economy, first of all. Uh, and secondly, it's disrupted various models that we had previously. Think of global value chains. They are going to be uh, rethought um, uh, because transportation is not working at the moment. 
Uh, so this is a major challenge. There will be a big move to localization of uh, value chains, a relocalize, uh, localization of um, manufacturing. The technologies actually permit that much more. Uh, advanced manufacturing, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, can replace cheap labor. So I think we need to really think this one through extremely carefully because uh, if we are not careful, we will exacerbate this uh, really uh, worrying trend of growing inequality uh, in the world, well, within societies and between societies. Uh, so that would be my worry. Now, of course, um, we have to be more positive in our thinking. And, um, and I think we have to now uh, very carefully analyze the impact of the pandemic and the stopping of the economy, all the measures that have been taken in response to the pandemic, carefully analyze what has happened and set about the task of restoring confidence um, Francis, can you hear me? Seem to have lost you. Is, is... No, I'm uh, perhaps oh. I'm uh, back uh, in audio mode. I had actually finished, Malcolm, but I'm not sure how much of it was coming through. I think you were you were just about to sum up. So I think we've got the main point that uh, you know we have to be very very careful in the recovery, not to exacerbate uh, the current inequalities. So we have to be very careful with the investment that. Uh, this is uh, Paolo Biev was uh, mentioning. I think that's it, uh, Francis? Yes, thank you, Malcolm, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> I can uh, pose the same question then to uh, Pateri uh, Talas. Pateri? The pessimistic view is that we would uh, go back to the normal uh, and, uh, and continue running our business as, as we did before the pandemic and uh, since there has been a gap in consumption and, uh, and, uh, and, and production and everything, that there would be even a boost of the, of the emissions uh, after this is uh, over. The optimistic view is that, uh, that, uh, that we, we have learned something and, uh, and, and uh, as part of our future uh, uh, restoration and uh, construction, uh, we would uh, at the same time think how, how to, how to Improve certain things in the world, and uh, and one of them is uh, how to how to how to tackle this climate uh, climate problem that we have, we have been facing, and uh, and uh, I think that there's an opportunity to to, to start uh, investing in in climate friendly technologies, and uh, also to invest in climate adaptation, and uh, and, and 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 as I said in my previous intervention. Uh, we don't need uh, uh, this this change uh, that is expected. It's not very dramatic as compared to what we have been uh, facing during the past uh, past months. Uh, so it's, it would be fairly moderate, uh, both economically and uh, and and also in our life uh, lifestyle. If we convert our energy systems, uh, our transport systems, and uh, and industry systems to be more climate friendly, and that's also a great opportunity. So that would be. That would be an opportunity to build some new uh, businesses, and, uh, and, uh, and and many countries have already decided to invest in in, in, in climate-friendly te technologies in, in as part of their recovery packages. For example, the government of Canada has announced such things, and uh, and, and that's very much the spirit in, in several European Union member countries. So, so, and, and personally, I'm optimistic that this is. Uh, this is a learning experience for us, and, uh, and 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 after this crisis is over, we could think how to build a better, better planet for 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 the coming decades and even centuries. Thank you very much, uh, Petari, for that uh, optimistic view. I think we have to keep optimistic in these circumstances. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, turning to the ambassador Sedikov for the same uh, question, please, ambassador. Much. It's uh, quite difficult to add anything after the <clears throat> distinguished speakers already responded to this. Uh, but nevertheless, I would like to say that, uh, first of all, it's not only the countries, but the whole system of international relations embodied primarily through the United Nations that is, has been put to test. And uh, our relations has been 
uh, undergoing the testing uh, so that we could uh, clearly understand what is it that makes uh, nations united. We know what uh, it, it was back in 1945, but now, now with this uh, pandemic, uh, which has disrupted the lives, livelihoods, economies, societies, uh, it's an, another big test that we're going through. Uh, we should also uh, learn quite well the lessons of the uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the, the goals were um, uh, quite important. Not all of them were implemented. And so we moved into the stage of SDGs with certain uh, amount of volume of unfinished business from, uh, from MDGs. Uh, the most important uh, issues that I uh, see looking from the perspective of the non-aligned movement, the difficulties is the digital divide. It was a lot has been said today about it. Financial situation of uh, countries, access to technologies, which is be becoming even more important. Uh, global supply chains and the situation, uh, how that will uh, that will change with the time uh, passing. Uh, as for the uh, strategic issues, uh, of course, uh, the strategic objectives of the countries normally do not change, even uh, with the negative effect uh, um, uh, of the um, of the something like pandemic. The policies can, uh, but the strategic objectives. Uh, they are too heavy to be uh, changed um, all, all of a sudden. Uh, so that's why the United Nations and the whole system of the UN has to uh, probably take all this into account and try to use the experience of, uh, of COVID-19, though difficult one, so that to make the system of the United Nations more flexible and uh, better um, uh, in terms of the bene benefiting the member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. As you say, a uh, com common enemy uh, brings us all together and uh, it certainly seems to be the case here. So um, thank you all very much uh, for that uh, response to, those, to the question. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, more time for any more questions. We're already running uh, well over, but um, we'll try to respond to some on the chat. So I'd like to uh, conclude by thanking all our panelists for their very interesting and insightful answers. I believe uh, we have been given an excellent review of the importance of ICTs for the achievement of the SDGs and the fight against uh, COVID-19. It's now 51 years since this day was first celebrated, but never before could there have been more justification to celebrate telecommunications and information society. We really see now how much we depend on it in so many different aspects and by so many different organizations and countries. More than ever before, good collaboration, coordination and cooperation between all stakeholders is essential. We all need to bring our own specific competencies to the table, avoid duplication of effort and pool our resources for the common good. Many thanks to those working with ITU in this effort, especially our sister UN organizations. And let's not forget the private sector. What has been remarkable over the last few months is the resilience of the networks and platforms to handle the huge increase in demand. So congratulations to them. In ITU, we've maintained our business with virtual meetings, both internal and external, uh, including providing uh, interpretation in six languages. These meetings have been particularly successful and have been very inclusive and efficient in reaching conclusions and decisions quickly. So let's hope some good will come of this terrible COVID-19 pan pandemic. Never before has there been so much reliance, emphasis and appreciation placed on telecommunications and the information society. As a result, it may be sooner and all of us will hopefully benefit from a reduction in emissions and pollution and a better work-life balance as a result of this new way of working. So let's look on the optimistic side 
And despite all the difficulties and challenges we now face, let us hope something good will come of this eventually. I wish you all a safe, a well, and a happy World Telecommunication and Information Society Day 2020. Thank you, and back to Nega. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. This brings to a close the World Telecommunication Information Society Day 2020. On behalf of the ITU, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers and all participants for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your views on the role and impact of ICTs in your work and on how ICTs are helping to achieve global goals. We would like to leave you with a wonderful video a compilation of our members' contributions to the Connect 2030 agenda. We invite you all to visit our Connect 2030 microsite to read about the full set of activities, including our membership contributions. This site provides a dashboard for both goals and targets of the Connect 2030 agenda, helping ITU and its members to progress together towards connecting the world. The link to access this new microsite is on your screen. I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon and please stay safe. World Telecommunication and Information Society Day reminds us that international cooperation on digital technology is essential to help defeat COVID-19 and achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I call on all of you to join me in advancing ITU's Connect 2030 Agenda, a shared global vision to bridge the digital divide, and use the power of information and communication technology in support of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development.
This brings us to the end of the ceremony. Thank you very much.